Nu var det ett mahjan genu. Skinnat ha olam. Shehiyanu. Vakimanu. Vihigiyanu. Lazman hazeh. Coming close to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I feel always moves me and throws me into a cycle that sometimes I ask myself, is this a cycle that's my cycle? And the truth of the matter is in our tradition, we have multiple cycles. I think I've shared this many times. We have a three-year cycle, we have a four-year cycle, we have Ola, we have Neto Revive for plants, for trees. We have the Shemitah, the sabbatical, we have the Yovel. We have four shmito, seven Shemitot, 49 years, and then 50 years. And um, the truth is, just last week, someone like really hurt my feelings. Really, really hurt my feelings. And the first thing I said to myself is, Mimi, it's so close to Yom Kippur, you have to forgive. And a minute later, I said to myself, it is so close to Yom Kippur, you can't forgive. I was I felt like I needed time. I needed time to deal with the issue. I needed time to be with it. So that's why I want to offer this constellation about thinking about multiple cycles of time. Forgiveness, looking at ourselves, self-evaluation. They have to be true and they have to be honest. I always say the Chagim never come early or late. The question is our timing with it. And to know that our tradition has multiple cycles of time that we can align ourselves with. In order to receive an invitation, to accept an invitation, it has to be a real invitation. I think it's legitimate and it's uh, truthful to be able to say to someone or to a situation, I would love to accept this invitation. I would love to take, take advantage of this opportunity, but I'm not there yet. I hope to get there, but I'm not there yet. So that is why, first of all, I want to offer this perspective when entering into these days and maybe ease a little bit on the should haves, could haves, need to, have to, has to. And ask ourselves if there's a have to, has to, need to, should to, be to, it's being honest and being true. There is another cycle that this completed itself actually this summer, and that is the cycle of Daf Yomi, that thousands of Jews all over the world have been connected to. And that was a seven and a half year cycle. It wasn't even a full seven years or full eight years. One of the gifts of Daf Yomi is that you can see images that you can't necessarily see otherwise. There's a story, there's a phrase that appears in the first tract of the Babli, of the Babylonian Talmud and in the last. And that is B'nei Rabbi Chia Nafuk It appears three times in the Babli. Three times the sons of Rabbi Chia go out to cultivate their business, to cultivate their fields, to look at their property. Each time it's translated, the same phrase is translated differently. I want to use it as a paradigm for going out in the world. To our business, to cultivate our property, those actions and activities that we embrace ourselves with. What I love about the difference between how they're described in the Bavli, in the Babylonian Talmud, and how they're described in the Ushalim, in the Jerusalem Talmud, is that in the Jerusalem Talmud, they actually have pri private names. But in the Babi, they're only known as B'nai Rabbi Chia, the sons of Rabbi Chia. And when they go out on their business, and the first story in Brachot, they go out, they come back, they realize that they've forgotten their Torah, their learning. And the first thing they say to themselves is, does our father know that we're so heartbroken that we can't remember what we've learned? And I would ask myself, why is that their first question? Why do they feel themselves so accountable to their father that the first thing they say is, whoa, does our father know how heartbroken we are that we forgot our learning? It's only when I got to the last tract of the Talmud, to Nida, when again, again, those magical words, the sons of Abichia go out on their way, to go out for business. And when they come home, their father asks them, what did you learn? What did you learn? Then it became clear to me, and as it appears in one other place in the Talmud, in Masechet Beitzah, 
that they were used to when they went out in their f to the field, went out on their business, when they came home, their father was there to say to them, even if you're not in the Beit Midrash, you think you're not learning? There's a life that is embraced in Torah. What have you learned while you were out in the world? And I want to say Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is that way that we're in our homes, we're in our davening, we're in our praying space. And then we go out into the world and we come back. I want to say that we're all Rosh Hashanah's children, we're all Yom Kippur's children. And we're going to be asked, what happened this year? What did you learn this year? And who do we answer to? So therefore, when Rabbi Chia is no longer in the world, they continue to answer to him. They continue to respond to him. I want to ask us, who do we answer to? Who do we relate to? Who are we accountable to as we go through the year? And who do we want us in the presence of as we sit down at Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? I want to share with you a short story. It's a, a personal story. Uh, many years ago, I was talking with my teacher in Yerushalayim, Adam Kuret Abokir Muskat, of blessed memory. I was trying to figure out how to let go of all the extra weight that I was carrying on my body. And I went to consult with her, a uh, wise, wise elder of our tradition. I said, Madame Kulet, why is this happening? And she didn't answer. We started talking. And a few minutes into the conversation, she looked at me and she said, Mimi, what are you afraid of? And without thinking, I said, I'm afraid of being judgmental. As if, if I lose all this weight, I'll become judgmental. She smiles and she says, and you are judgmental. In a very strong European French accent. And then I continue talking and all of a sudden again she throws out at me, Mimi, what are you afraid of? And again without thinking, I said, I'm afraid that my relationship to Torah and Mitzvot will change. And she smiled and said, you'll always have your relationship to God. And we continue talking. And then she says, me, what are you afraid of? And again, without thinking, I say, I'm afraid of life. Not of living, but of life. She smiles and asks for me to define the difference between the two. And again, without thinking, I say, living is an obligation. Life is a celebration. And she smiled in silence. I want to offer this as a gift to think about. Was this past year a year of living? Or was this past year a year of life? And what are we asking for ourselves for the year to come? Are we asking for living? Obligation? Are we asking for life? I believe there's a way that the two can come together. There are different ways that we can offer an offering to the temple, to God. Erich, the essence, the meme, our value in the work market. Those are our actions. I think there's a way to bring the two together. I think in the prayer that we add to our tefillah, beginning with Rosh Hashanah, through Aseret Yimei Tshuva, through the Ten Days of Atonement, I think there's actually a response to both of those. We say, Zohrenu Lechaim. Remember us to living. Melech Hafetz Bechaim. The king that aspires and desires life. And write us in the book of living for your sake, the God of life. I want to say that when the Talmud says in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, in the tractat of Rosh Hashanah, like the book of Chaim and not are opened on Rosh Hashanah, I want to say that it's the book of living and the book of dying, not the book of life and the book of death. God can sign us, whatever that image means, whatever God's signing means to you. We can be designated in that paradigm, in that theological paradigm with living. But life is in our hands. How we live this year to come, how we lived this year that was, Yes, we breathe 354 days, but how many moments, not even days, how many moments of every day did we actually, were we actually in life? And the year to come, God can grant us years and years, God willing, of living. 
but there's something that we have to do. There's a responsibility. I want to say we need to be not only who are we accountable in terms of those who have brought us into the world, those who have walked with us, our friends, our family, our teachers, but also how do we answer to ourselves? How are we accountable to ourselves? How do we say to ourselves, living, thank you God for granting me living, but I want so much more for myself. I want so much more for the life that I have. I want not to survive. I want not to live. I want to celebrate. I want to be in life. And therefore I believe that as we're praying, we're asking the God of living Please grant us an opportunity to rise to life. Give us the gift of living one more year so that we can then offer you as our offering to you, as our gift to you, our life. Remember us God for living. The God that desires life. The Kodvenu Besefer Achayim inscribe us in the book of living, Lemaancha Elohim Chayim, for your sake, the God of life. And if I can add one more thing, please don't be stingy. When you talk to God, when you ask, when you pray, don't forget to say, Master the world, if you sign me in the book of living, then don't forget my family, don't forget my friends, don't forget my students. Don't forget my teachers. May we all know that we can't be signed alone in the Book of Living. That in order for us to be in life, there are those that need to walk with us. May we sign ourselves in the Book of Life as God signs us in the Book of Living. And may we ask and beseech on behalf of all those that we live with and that we want to be in life with. May we beseech on their behalf as well. That we should all be signed in the Book of Living and commit to the book of life and to live life. Shana Tova, Ktiva Vechatima Tova. May God do the Ktiva, the writing. May we do the signing, the Chatima, in the book of life.